With his own diary tapes and other unique recordings, Tony Benn recalls his involvement as the MP for Chesterfield in the year-long miners' strike of 1984. The miners have always enjoyed enormous public support because of the work they do, because of the spirit of solidarity they've always reflected, and because people feel that they've been badly treated. And the 1984-85 miners' strike produced a tremendous amount of public support. What characterised it was the way in which the government was prepared to use the full powers of the state to crush them, the enemy within. And uh, there's one aspect of the miners' strike I want to touch on in this programme, the relations between the police and the miners, because the police were the instruments of government policy. And uh, this came to my notice on many occasions, but I've never forgotten one night in June when the miners had marched in London. And I had been supporting them throughout, and I still do. But uh, uh, on the night of that demonstration, I was approached in the House of Commons and told that some of them were being held in the Rochester Row police station. The whole procession took more than half an hour to file past from start to finish, one of the biggest trade union demonstrations seen in London in recent years, and a powerful reminder to the MPs who will debate the situation this afternoon of the size and importance of the issue. And we've just heard that the police have made a number of arrests after scuffling broke out among marchers at the rear of the procession. Thursday, the 7th of uh, June, 1984. Just as um, I was going through the lobby, 10.15, Dennis Skinner said, there are 67 miners who've been held as a result of uh, scuffles in Parliament Square in Rochester Road Police Station. Will you go and see them? So I picked up Brian Sedgemore and Tam Diel and Eric Heffer drove us to Rochester Road Police Station and we went in and uh, spoke to a young officer type in his late twenties. Absolutely said, good evening Mr. Ben and all very courteous and all that. And I said, I understand you've got 67 miners here and I want to see them. I had kept my tape recorder running the whole time in my little shoulder bag so the whole thing is recorded, but I did wonder whether it was entirely proper to record, but I thought, well, when you're dealing with the enemy, why not? Okay, so can we see the commander? Who is in charge here? Do you want me to bring anyone I over? think you will bring him over first, because in the light of what well, we've been... Well, he's on his way over, Mr. Ben. Do you want me to... <coughs> so then this uh, rather decayed-looking man of late 40s, early 50s, mid-50s, with greying hair and a lot of encrusted silver on his hat and a a sort of field marshal's insignia on his shoulder arrived, and I said, I want to see you. Well, now, look, we heard you were holding 60 people, or 67. Yeah. We understand you've held them since 4 o'clock. They have not had food. Yeah. They have not been charged. We've been told that 5 and 6 are in a cell and that they can't breathe and that they're having to be taken out, and we want to know what is happening. We want to see them in the cells. In the course of the discussion, I said to him, I cannot understand, uh, Commander, how it is you allow the police to be used in this way. I said, you're just uh, being used by the government for political purposes. Well, he said, I can't comment on that. Well, I said, maybe you can't. But I said, uh, can you explain why it is that the Metropolitan Police Constables in Derbyshire on the picket lines with miners who've got nothing to live on are waving their £600 a week pay slips? And he said, well, you can't justify that. Well, I, I said, I should think you can't. And Brian Sedgemore, who was a big, tall man and a barrister, uh, made the point that um, there was no justification whatever for keeping them for hours without food, for treating them this way, uh, when they were only charged with obstructing the highway, threatening behaviour, or obstructing the police, which are pretty minor offences. And then we heard that because the ventilation had been so poor, with five in a cell, and the ventilation system had actually broken down, and the temperature was so high and they were suffocating, they had actually been handcuffed and marched round the police yard simply to get air. We went into the cells and there they were, uh, I think 15 cells, uh, measuring about seven foot by six. And um, even with the door open you could hardly breathe and there was a little plate about a foot long and six inches wide with holes drilled in it. Uh, above the door, and uh, all the ventilation came into the cell through that. Well, that would be just about enough for one person to breathe, but with a high summer temperature and the ventilator broken down, you just couldn't breathe, and it was really quite frightening to go in alone 
with the door open, but to be there shut, with absolutely no windows and this little ventilator, must have been an absolute nightmare. Right. Right. I said, I shall never forget tonight. And I went out, and then, of course, we talked to the people who were outside, and um, there was this anxious little group of miners standing in Rochester Row, and uh, we heard that the Greenwich Labour Party had offered to put them up overnight, and a phone call had been made, and so just after midnight, having taken all the details and listened to everything that had happened, I went home. I was so upset and so angry, and to think that this is happening in Britain, uh, it's unbelievable. I mean, people just would not believe what's happening. And they were treated like criminals. In July, talks began between Arthur Scargill, Peter Heathfield, Mick McGarkey, and McGregor, the chairman of the National Coal Board. And I was able to uh, learn something of these talks with Peter Heathfield, an old friend of mine. Saturday the 7th of July, I got up at 7, missed my breakfast, but I had a sandwich and a banana, and I walked to the station and went to Nottingham for the IWC, Institute of Workers' Control and Labour Coordinating Committee joint conference on how we should approach the ballots with the trade unions. And then I went over to the club, and who should I see as soon as I got to the club but Peter Heathfield. So uh, we sat in the garden just around the front on a little bench they bought off the Ho Royal Hospital when it was closed, and I asked him about the talks that had taken place uh, this week. And I must say, uh, Peter is marvellous. He's totally relaxed. He's got a tremendous sense of humour. And uh, he looked brown and cheerful. And he said that they, the talks had gone really very well from the point of view of the NUM. He said uh, McGregor uh, was trying to be friendly. But after nine hours, he began to get a bit knackered. And uh, clearly, as an old man, you can sort of test his stamina. The three of them worked extremely well together. They had uh, um, Arthur uh, and, uh, and Peter Heathfield and uh, Mick McGarkey. And, of course, the three of them are interesting because Arthur is totally unyielding and unbending and is a field commander. Peter is a negotiator, a diplomat, and Mick McGarkey is a straightforward old statesman. And uh, they're a fantastic team, and they are totally united, absolutely united. And they realize there's an attempt to split them, and they're not having it. They said they had frequent adjournments. And they would just sit and have a cup of tea it's, uh, during the adjournment. And then when they came back, they'd say, uh, we've given careful consideration to the point you made. Well, actually, they hadn't at all. And it is, uh, it's a trial of, of strength, really. Once again, they went badly, turning sometimes into farce. Mr. McGregor arrived at one hotel with a plastic bag over his head. And then he and Mr. Scargill announced they couldn't do business because of the press and broadcasting interest. The only thing I want to say, this representative of the Coalboard of the Union, is that the media harassment today has made it impossible for this talk to continue at this venue. And we are now making arrangements to move to another venue where the talks will continue. He said McGregor was trying to be very friendly. And, ah, come on, Arthur, you must um, uh, do this. And uh, Mick, you better come fishing with me in Scotland. And, uh, wow, uh, Peter, what about a game of golf? And all that stuff, you see. And uh, we said to McGarkey, what about a game of golf? And McGarkey said, I've never, I've never played golf in my life. It's a total waste of time. And McGregor goes, oh, come on, uh, Mick, uh, we can uh, get on well together. So, truthfully, if it was all being videoed and watched, it would be absolutely fascinating. Anyway, uh, Peter and I, we must have had about an hour, an hour and a half, I think, just talking in the lovely evening uh, uh, sunshine outside the club. And he was prepared to say a great deal, uh, uh, which I didn't think he would be ready to say, and I didn't want to press him. But the fact was that he was confident that, was, that they were going to win. I rang mother, who's got diverticulitis, and Dr. Brown thinks she may have to go into hospital, which is an awful nuisance. And, um, oh, I don't know, I picked up all my messages and on the, the supreme telephone answering machine, which will, where you can phone from a distance and pick up all the messages that have been there and repeat them or skip them and wipe them and all the rest. Marvellous piece of equipment. <coughs> and I came back to bed.
Relations between the miners and the police and the local communities was an absolutely crucial part of all this. And I was very concerned about it as a local MP for Chesterfield. And uh, I met the acting chief constable to express my anxiety to him and to hear what he had to say about it because of the long-term implications for law and order. Thursday the 13th of September got up at just before six and then at seven o'clock we all went off on the picket line with the soup. First place we went to was Markham where there were some hundreds of pickets I think and a mass force of police all in yellow jackets and uh, literally as soon as I appeared on the site the police were marched off put in the buses and driven away I mean it was absolutely magical and it was a confirmation of this theory they all have that uh, I have a way of dispersing police then I went, gosh, what happened after that? I can't remember. Oh, yes, yes, of course I can remember. The chief constable, the assist acting chief constable, Mr. Leonard, said he wanted to see me. He wrote to me a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he said, Leonard said to me at the beginning, I think it'd be a good idea to have a talk because I think some, from some of the things you've been saying about police action, you misunderstand that I've got complete operational control, the National Police Reporting Headquarters is only simply a telephone exchange where I call for the help I need. I've only got 1,800 policemen in the whole of Derbyshire. And I listened to that very carefully, and I said, well, thank you very much, but I have, remember, a certain amount of Whitehall experience as a minister. I was minister during the winter of discontent, and I know perfectly well the Home Secretary chairs a meeting with the police and the army and ministers, and all the instructions are given by the Home Secretary. So please don't uh, ask me to believe that you're in charge. I don't honestly believe you are. Well, then he made a great point about how in Derbyshire the Mets were under his control, the Mets were not as bad as we thought, because I had complained about them, that those Mets, uh, Metropolitan Police that were unsuitable had been sent away. He then said, you may think me cynical, and you may think I'm scapegoating, but it suits our book to see the Mets criticised, because when the uh, strike is over, the Derbyshire Constabulary will be able to resume relations with the local people and say, well, of course, it was the Mets that caused the trouble. I thought that was a bit risky for him to say that. Generally speaking, I gave him the impression, as I had at the very outset of the talk, that the situation was absolutely explosive and it was no point in pretending that it was just going to go easily because it wasn't. He said uh, people attack or police attack the idea of being under the control of the left-wing extremists in local authorities. Well, I'm equally against right-wing extremists in the cabinet controlling us, which again was a hostage to fortune. Uh, he said, I'm quite independent. I'm there to peacekeep and enforce the law. And if there's a conflict between the two, then I have probably to keep the peace. And uh, he was looking forward to the time when it would all be over. And I said, well, I think your problems will begin then. Um, and uh, we talked for an hour and a quarter and had an exchange of views and I said to him, I'm wholly committed on the miners' side and I can't talk to the police on the picket line but if the Police Federation would like to come and see me I'd be happy to have a discussion and on that uh, cordial note he left. I think one of the worst parts of it for me was the treatment of the miners, defending their communities and their work and a basic national interest, coal, we've got 300 years under our territory, treating them as criminals. I couldn't believe at the time that this was happening in Britain and then at the very end when the miners went back, it had an element of genuine tragedy about it and yet and yet the truth of what they were saying remained and was vivid in people's minds in 1992 and 1993 when the same issues came back upon the agenda.